Hi everyone. So today I finished another um, section of this book by Pope Francis. I like his writing. It's it's so good. His writing, Pope Francis with Dominique Walton, A Future of Faith. So the uh, the interview was basically on tradition and how tradition is always evolving and the the roots remain the same but tradition evolves so in africa you'll find that sometimes our services can go on <laughs> for two or three hours and it can become very very long but they like to dance in the church in the services so that's why it takes so long because they dance and they have music and things like that. So with Vatican II, Vatican II changed everything. It brought in enculturation, where the culture of that country gets brought into the mass. And you'll find that they'll have statues like the Black Madonna, or you'll have statues representing the people of that nation. So some people don't like that. They want Jesus to be this white man and the Holy Family to be this white family, when in fact <laughs> that may not have been the case at all. They were, they were Jewish people, so I think it's good because it helps people to reflect on Jesus, on the Holy Family in their own culture. And when it comes to morals, like some people will say, well, slavery exists and that's just the way it is. And in Canada, they say that too. When they don't like something or they don't want to change something, they'll say, well, that's the way it is. And you're like, well, that doesn't mean it's right. And they're like, well, life's not fair, is it? Because it benefits them. It doesn't benefit someone like me that's come into the country and that needs help or that wants to get a better life or a better job. So that's why they answer like that, even with slavery. Slavery exists, it doesn't mean it's right. Feudalism exists, it doesn't mean it's right. And so the church always has to take us back to our roots and how it evolves and changes. And nothing changes unless it comes from us. Like the, the teachers of the church, the magisterium, all of them, they teach us, but Change also comes from us, it comes from our trade unions, it comes from people coming together in small groups, organizing. I always laugh when I get these um, invitations like from Tennis Canada for the Unmatched Conference or to go to the Labour Cup and I'm like, do you know how much I earn? <laughs> thanks for sending it, but no thanks. Sometimes I do try if they are online events I will try to join in because it's ridiculous. I mean, after 22 years of being in this country, I'm basically in the same position and things are not getting better instead of they're getting worse financially for me and for many others. I have many people that message me, South Africans, um, Zimbabweans who are in the same position as me. They are people that have come into the country, they've retrained, they've requalified, and they can't get work. So if we can't get work, we can't help our church, us slave people. So the money dries up in the church, the church starts falling down, and the businesses are not there to run our churches. We don't want them, if they want to donate or do things or whatever, they can do it, but they mustn't come and dictate to our churches how they want things done because at the end of the day the church and the state are separate for a reason so they need to keep it that way the other thing that Pope Francis talked about in this was about gender ideology so how people are saying that oh you can choose to be whatever you want to be completely secular like France and that is not necessarily the case. If we are created as women or men, then we are women or men. We are not, it's not like, oh, I'm a woman, but I identify as a man. And that's what's happening today. People can say, oh, cut your ears short, cut it short. 
Maybe I don't like having my hair short because I already have such masculine features. Maybe I like wearing my dresses and skirts and having my hair long and dyeing it and putting blonde streaks in it because it makes me more feminine. Maybe I like all those things and I don't like to have my hair short like a man. So it's interesting to read his uh, thoughts and how he explains it to the journalist because it helps me. I always like to go back and read my uh, notes and whatever I did when I studied theology. Now it's a long time. I graduated in 2011, but I also like to pick up new books and read them and then deepen my faith that way so that I can help others when I'm invited to lead retreats online maybe with the Jesuits in Britain or with other organizations, then at least I'm deepening my faith and I'm continuing to upgrade my skills. So I enjoyed reading that. And some of his talks are very long. Some of them are very short, but I like to read them. And he also talked about how um, when he gives his uh, speeches, he has a thought in mind, but then he goes and he he speaks on it. So it's nice to again get that voice of the author coming through. That's what I like to read when I read his interviews or what he's talking about or the encyclicals. And thank God Vatican II happened. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to go into a church and have the Mass in Latin every time I go to church and not be able to understand what's taking place or what's happening and not be able to participate. Vatican II helped us to participate in the Mass. So I like it and I like his um, teaching. And I'm not giving up. I mean, I'm not old. I mean, people say ageism and it counts against you, but we also have experience when we are a little bit older and when we are middle-aged. We have the experience of life, we have the education, and we can use that. It's not like I'm 80 years old that I can't start a career or start over in another country or start over in something else. I'm still young. If I was 80 years old, then yes, you could tell me, oh, you can't do it, it's not possible, you can't hold a job, you can't do anything. I'm not old. And I'm not decrepit, and even people who are disabled, people who are in wheelchairs, are doing things with their lives, so why can't I? People are playing tennis who are in wheelchairs. People are competing at the Olympics who are disabled. People are traveling the world. They own their own private jets and they fly first class, so why can't I? I mean, I didn't come this far to land up in poverty and I hope that they will come when I get those invites from Unmatched where I'll say, yes, I'm not only buying that ticket, I'm going first class to go and watch tennis somewhere in Wimbledon or wherever. Why can't I dream? Why should I be content with the little I have and listen to people who speak negative into my life? I don't have to. And the gospel is not about that anyway. The gospel is about good news. It's about flourishing. It's about reaching our potential, whether we are able-bodied or not fully able-bodied. It's about the call to action. And it's not about being cruel like the communists. It's not about being rough. It's about gentleness and coming forth and tenderness and compassion. And we have times of mourning. I mean, when I lose my friends or when I lose people, I mourn for them. I know other people say it's a celebration of life, but for me, I go through that process of letting go, of mourning, of saying that person is no longer with me now and remembering them. And yes, we'll have the, I'll have the rest of my life to celebrate their life and to remember the good times, but I allow myself to grieve. And that's also part of our tradition in our church. It's part of the scriptures there's a period of mourning that we go through. So if you get a chance to pick up this book or to read it, it's a very good book. 
And sometimes father gives books away in the church after he's read them or other people. So I'll pick them up and I'll bring them home and then I'll read them slowly. We all share in that way. Sometimes when I have things I'm finished with, I'll take them and I'll give them to the church and then somebody else can pick it up and read it. It's no use just keeping it for myself. Yes, there's certain books I keep that I go back to that I refer to for my journaling, for my talks like this that I'm doing. But I'm hoping that now that I've got the spiritual direction and the speaking, I'll be able at least to make some extra money from that. Life is not just about money. It's also about the things that help us to grow, that help us to flourish, that bring us life. I would like to have a house with a garden. I was watching this documentary on YouTube about how in California uh, the police were arresting people in the parks because they went into the parks and they fell asleep. So, I mean, it's just become, that's all it's become. I mean, sometimes I used to go to the park and fall asleep. Now, if I'm feeling tired or whatever, I don't go. I just stay here in my condo or I go up to our rooftop and I sit there. At least that way, if I fall asleep, I don't risk being arrested. So it's very hard when people know that you're unemployed and you're looking for work. Some people help, but not everybody does. And California, which was the, one of the richest places, it's now becoming very poverty driven. People are sleeping in their cars. The government is putting out coffee and tea and muffins so that they can come in the morning and have something to eat. It's very, very hard all over now, not just in Zimbabwe and places like that. Zimbabwe and places like that are affected, yes, because they're dealing with droughts and they're dealing with not having food in the rural areas. But it's similar to what happened in Ireland. I mean, if you go to the shops, the shops are full. So if you've got money and you can buy that food, you don't have any problem. But all the, the rich foods, the fruits, the vegetables, all that, it's being exported, it's being sent overseas to Canada, to England, to other places, just like they did to the Irish. And they call it the Irish potato uh, famine. But really, the, the food was there, but it wasn't going to the people that needed it the most. So I'm just praying that I get a break and I get a good paying job and that I work with people who value me and who promote me and not have all these bad experiences like I had because it's been one thing after the other. And there's no reason why I shouldn't be earning 70 or 80,000 a year just like everybody else, if not more, because I've worked hard and I want to buy a property, I want to have land around me, I want to have a garden I can walk in. I watched that, um, documentary on Adam Clayton's uh, gardening and his property. It's so beautiful. I would love to have a place like that. Absolutely, I would love it. It's so amazing. And if other people can do it, why can't I? So that's how I feel about life. I'm not one of these people that says, oh, just be content with the little you have. That's not me.